everyone, welcome to Adobe Live. It is Monday, November 30th, and I hope you guys are ready to get started. I'm Spencer Nugent. I've been here a few times, and I'm a creator, educator, speaker, designer. I do a lot of things. And one of the things I love to do is to draw and paint. So that's what we're going to be doing today. If you want to interact, there is the Behance chat on behance.net slash live. Feel free to post questions there. I like to be interactive take your suggestions, all that good stuff. So hopefully you've got your hot bean juice in tow. I do. Um, as a reminder, I did present at Adobe Max. So if you're curious about Adobe Fresco, which is what we're gonna be doing today and want a workbook as along with some pretty in-depth demos on how to sketch and draw in the app, feel free to check that out. Pretty easy to find. Today, we're gonna to be going over the app a little bit, um, going over some best practices that I've discovered in my experience over 15 years as a designer, creator, illustrator, and so forth. So we're gonna get started and jump right in. All right, let's see here. Let me just switch over to the iPad. Okay, boom. I think I forgot to... <laughs> Um, actually update the schedule, but we've got a jam-packed day today. Should be pretty exciting. All right. Okay, so this is Adobe Fresco. If you've never used it before, it's Adobe's drawing app that is available on professional drawing tablets like the iPad Pro, the Surface Pro by Microsoft, as well as some Wacom Mobile Studio Pro products. So depending on how you like to work, the app is available on a variety of platforms. So if it's your first time seeing this and you open the app, this is what you'll be presented with. We have the uh, home screen, if you will. We have home, your work, you can learn and discover new things. So if the stream today is not enough, you can actually tap on learn and find additional tutorials and helps. They make it super easy. One of the best things about Fresco is it's absolutely free. So you can download it, jump right in. Tons of great brushes. We'll be using those brushes today. Just by way of information, so you know what's ahead, I'm going to focus on some basics of lighting and understanding how light works and perspective before we jump into doing our real painting, stuff like that. So today and tomorrow, um, well, we'll kick things off with some basics today. Tomorrow we'll actually create a scene, a painting, Bob Ross style, if you will, um, or as I sometimes like to call myself, Black Ross, but <laughs> we're going to do a painting, all right? You can also discover additional work tutorials. There I am right there. So pretty awesome. All there in your Adobe Fresco main screen. Hello, everyone. We've got Sean, Melancholy, Steven, Ariana, lots of people joining the stream. Thank you so much. Just as a reminder, I'm not really paying attention to the YouTube stream, um, or at least the chat, I should say. So you'll want to head over to behance.net slash live. In addition, whatever you create today, if you want to share that, you can hop over to the Photoshop Discord. That's bit.ly slash PS Discord and share your work. All right. In the middle of the screen, we have the option to start a new document. Okay. And Fresco even gives you sneaks. So if you want to view new and upcoming free features, that's in the top right in the home screen. You can check, you can check that out. All right. Um, so we're going to create a new document. And I my, my default is the tabloid size. That's about an A3. I believe A3, yes, A3 sized piece of paper if you're used to that, um, or like two letter sized pieces of paper put together, okay? Um, little pop-up here, I just updated Fresco, or I might be using the, the pre-release, but in any case, um, Fresco does save your documents as you work. So it's one less thing to worry about as long as you have Adobe Creative Cloud, your documents will be backed up and stored, okay? This means you can access them on your desktop as well, should you choose to do that, which is pretty awesome. Okay, so here's our main interface. Fresco has gone ahead and named our document based on the date, which is super helpful. That was a more recent update. On the left side of the screen, I'm not gonna go through all the tools here, but on the left side of the screen, we have all your brushes. So there's pixel brushes, vector brushes, what's called live brushes, which we're gonna use today. Smudge, erase, move, select, a few familiar things if you've used Photoshop before, you'll recognize those icons, which is nice. Okay, that interplay of apps is really nice in terms of even figuring out what does what. 
at the top right of the screen, we have options for collaboration, for undo, redo. Okay. I'm going to go ahead in my settings. I always forget to do this. And under app settings and input, let's see. I'm going to turn on this thing that'll show touches. So you'll actually see where I'm touching on the screen. Okay. So undo, redo is right here. Or you can take your two fingers, right? These two, these two, whatever you like to use tap the screen and it'll undo what you did. Okay. We'll be using that. So if, if something magical happens and you're like, what happened? <laughs> it's likely that I used a gesture to finger tap on the screen. All right. There's a few other things in settings you might want to um, consider turning on. There's also a touch shortcut. So that's going to be this little circle on the screen. And what this does is it actually acts as a modifier for your brush. So for example, if you're doing a lot of quick sketching and you just want to move very quickly, you can use your thumb the way I like to have it anyways is let's see in my little thumbnail here, my thumb at the corner of the screen. And that way I can just activate that touch shortcut. If you like to use it, if you don't like to use it, you can turn it off. So I won't be using it too much, but if you have questions, happy to answer those. If you're working along with me, you can share or export. So we can export to illustrator, do a quick export. You can even start live streaming from uh, fresco if you have that enabled as well which is pretty awesome um, or if you just want to export your file when you're done we'll be doing that as well and i'll show you how to do that on the right we have layers layer settings being able to add comments and work collaboratively which is a pretty cool awesome new feature in fresco that allows you to work with teams so if you're working on the same illustration and you want uh, feedback critique that kind of thing you can invite people to your document and then have them leave comments and so forth. Um, we can make new layers, we can group, and there's clipping masks, which admittedly I rarely use, but Kyle Webster actually just published a video on clipping masks. I don't have the link right now, but pretty easy to find. And he explains the value there. So if you like to work that way, there's great resources and videos that'll show you how to do that. In addition, there is a ruler and we can position this ruler with two fingers on the screen position it where we want to just like that pretty easy okay and then when you're ready to draw right now the default pencil is selected as my brush so if i draw on either side of this ruler i get a nice straight line so if drawing straight lines is a challenge for you then you may find some use for the ruler um, personally i prefer to just work with um, freehand sketching so that tends to be tends to be how I do things. All right, I'm going to move myself a little bit here. Well, maybe not. I'll have to readjust later. Anyhow, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to show you a couple warmups that I've, I find effective when drawing. So I'm a product designer by trade, which means I draw a lot of objects. Okay, and perspective is really important. Understanding structure, drawing from observation, so I can draw from my imagination. Super, super important. So to do that and get ready, here's a, here's three warm up exercises, three, that's not three, that's one. Here's three warm up exercises I like to do. So the first one, and you'll notice that I kind of rotate the canvas to the angle that works for me. That's just a, a factor, if you will, of, um, making myself comfortable so that I'm not having to contort myself to the drawing, but making the drawing accommodate me personally. Um, and I think that's super important if you're if you're drawing make sure that you are comfortable um and relaxed when you draw because your attitude kind of translates into your drawing all right so what i'm going to do here is draw with my shoulder so what that means is that i am using my shoulder and my elbow as pivots so if i'm drawing a straight line it's something like this okay if i'm drawing a circle it's like this notice my wrist doesn't move that much unless i'm working on a really small area so draw with your shoulder super important elbow as pivot and shoulder okay so that's what we're going to be doing if it's helpful you can put two dots down on the screen or you could draw straight lines on either side and then try and draw straight lines between those two lines so when i was in school um, learning to draw. I'm actually from a computer science, physics, math background. I actually wanted to be a math teacher. Can you imagine that? Math teacher. 
I have to teach myself how to draw, how to how to to figure things out, um, with the help of professors, of course. And so one of the most useful things was warming up. And so I would do many, many of these um, all the time. Okay. So many pages, and you want to you want to do as much quantity as you can. Because quantity eventually, well, the right quantity will lead to better quality um, eventually. So something to consider and think about as you practice. The next exercise we're going to do is drawing circles. Sounds like a few people might be having issues with the uh, YouTube player. So maybe just reload and see if it pops up. Okay, so next thing is a circle, right? Circle, round. Nice and easy. And we're going to use all of these when we start painting and talking about light and perspective. So super important here. So we'll start with some circles on the screen. I was talking with a friend of mine, actually, who is a comic book artist, illustrator. I'll just say for a very large publication. And um, I was streaming on YouTube and asked, asked him, hey, do you warm up when you draw? And he was like, no, <laughs> I don't warm up. I just draw. It's like, okay. And I, I kind of get it. Sometimes I'll do a warm up sketch in addition to the warm up exercises. But again, from a product design perspective, it's kind of important for me to uh, understand and know how to draw these structures. Okay. Tim says, great opportunity to try out new brushes when you do these warm up. Absolutely. Um, for me, it's more about the mechanics, but it's also an opportunity to try something new. So if you want to maybe warm up with different strokes, no pun intended, or <laughs> you want to uh, try a different brush, I think that's a great, great idea for sure. All right, so now I'm going to do ellipses. And since I have my coffee mug here, an ellipse is essentially a circle viewed at an angle in perspective. Okay, you can kind of see it in my coffee cup there, right there. And I draw lots of ellipses. If you're drawing cars, if, you, if you're going to draw a spaceship, if you're going to draw a grain silo in a scene that you're then going to paint, whatever it is, you need to understand how to draw an ellipse, right? So without explaining all the mechanics of an ellipse right now, we're just going to start by warming up by drawing some ovals. You can kind of think of them as ovals as well. All right, so the, the trick here is to kind of ghost or hover over the drawing before you commit. Good morning, Felix. Hello, and Mona. Just warming up. All right, so the, the idea is to hover over the screen and then commit to your stroke. All right, and the better you get, the more confident your ellipses will be. Okay, I'm trying to get a nice progression here. And I'll show you why this is important in just a second. At least from a product design perspective. So I'm noticing in my warm up, it's also important to pay attention to what you're doing. So in my warm up, I'm noticing um, I'm making too big of jumps, if you will, in those ellipses. And what I mean is the width of the ellipse here. Okay, too big a jump. And like Tim said, you know, it's a good opportunity to try new brushes. Um, part of that is just being thoughtful about your process and understanding what you do and why things look the way they do. Super, super important and helpful if you're drawing. Um, Drawing is is easier than you think. I know that that may sound weird, but it's a little it's easier than you think if you if you actually think about it. All right. So now that I've made that observation, I'm going to make some corrections here and try and get an easier transition. So notice from column, let's call this column C, B, A. So from B to C, right, I'm trying to make smaller steps here, right, and work on my control. Okay, as to how wide those ellipses are. So again, just pay attention to what you're doing um, as you warm up. Let's do one more row here. See if we can get a bit more finesse in. It's okay to overlap your ellipses if you want. The default brushes in Fresco are great. Tomorrow we're gonna be importing and making and modifying brushes. So that should be, should be fun if you're into that. Right. Okay, so there's this there's a sequence of ellipses. Now, if I wanted to draw something like my coffee mug that I just showed you, I can just connect connect a few of these. All right. If I rotate my screen here, let's connect connect a few of these. 
like so. Now we have the bottom. It's a very tall cup. So I can connect the bottom like that. And let's go ahead and draw a little handle here in perspective, like so. And boom. So that's why these warm ups are super important because you're actually training your brain, your eyes to kind of do the things that exist in reality. At least that's the way I like to think about it. Now, if I rotate the pencils on its side and shade on the screen, just like you would with the real pencil, we can get a nice shadow here. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. Understanding light and shadow reflections and so forth. And we can shade this in as well on the top. So now from my warm up exercise, we have a quick coffee cup. Pretty cool. So it's not a waste of time. Don't think about these exercises like, ah, oh, I got to do this again. It's a waste of time. I've watched your Behance streams for Adobe Live and you do these warm ups and it's like, yeah, <laughs> I do them because they are important. All right. So I'm going to hide that layer. If you're curious how to hide the layer, that's just located on the right. It's the eye. Just like if you were to close your eyes, everything disappears. Okay. You see blackness, darkness. Um, if I, let me move this mic just a little bit. Let me know if anything's off. Um, so if I tap that icon, everything's now hidden. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about just basic general principles of perspective. Okay. Um, if I were to, to summarize perspective without getting too technical, it's really about things that are close and on the other extreme, we'll have things that are far away. So things that are close are going to be big or large. Okay. Things that are far away are going to be smaller. Okay. Things that are close are going to have more detail. And things that are far are going to have less detail. We're going to have increased color saturation and the opposite. And you can kind of see, hopefully, see the pattern here. All right. And with the saturation, you have um, haze. Okay. That's something that, that can happen if you're painting. This is going to be important for tomorrow. If you're painting a landscape, that kind of thing. Okay. So just some things to observe. And here's a couple examples. If I draw two two-dimensional shapes, okay, no perspective here, but if I draw two two-dimensional shapes on my screen here, my canvas, okay, and I were to ask you which of these is more important or which of these is closer, okay, you could use this uh, means of deduction to determine what's closer. So something that's bigger, say this one, Okay, we can make the assumption that it is closer. Now, if I actually connect the corners of these shapes, okay, you're going to notice something. All right, and I was able to do this without uh, <laughs> these lines because of practice. But we essentially have a system of perspective here that I've created. This is, you know, one point. And that one point is the point to which all those lines will recede. Okay, very simple one point perspective. You can use this for interior design projects if you want to draw a room. If you want to draw something simple like a vanity or whatever, okay, one point perspective. Um, the way I like to think about one point perspective is kind of like this cube or this this box, right? This face is facing you guys, the viewer, right? So we have the faces of our shapes here facing us. Two point perspective is going to be something like this, okay, where we now have one corner that is closest to us, the viewer, okay? And a three-point perspective, I'm just gonna do this without, there's that two-finger tap. I'm gonna do this without the vanishing lines. All right, but a three-point perspective now, and this is pretty exaggerated, is going to have one point that is closest to us, the viewer. So it's almost like taking this box and rotating it like that. And you can kind of see the edges of that box now tapering in. Okay, so understanding 3D space is important if you're gonna draw things that you want to look real, whether it be an object or scene or anything like that. Okay, so like I said, there is the idea of size that factors into perspective, detail, and color saturation. Now these are all in black and white, but 
if there were some detail, like let's say hmm, some texture or something, you know, I may take some more time to texturize the one up front. Okay. We're not going to texture the whole thing, but I just want to show you a little example here. I might even zoom in, kind of work on things like so. <laughs> What's up, Rob? Good to see you here. Um, so I may work on the texture up front quite a bit. Okay. Lots of shading, things like that. And then as you move further away, it might just be a general shade like that. So you can kind of see the difference, right? In terms of, Hey, there's, there's a texture here, but we're not going through the trouble of putting in all the details. So those are things that are going to communicate to someone in two dimension, meaning sketching on a screen that this thing is three-dimensional and has perspective detail color saturation scale all right so now i want to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, light and shadow okay so light is interesting <laughs> like i said i'm from a math and physics background so i actually like to think about the technical aspects of light um, light travels in waves these waves tend to travel in straight lines um, depending on the light source you can assume they're parallel lines if you're if I've lost you, come on back, come on back. It's okay. All right, we're just gonna start with a simple shape here. Okay, create a new layer. If you want to make a new layer, hit that plus sign on the right. It'll pop a new layer in. I'm not super organized, but I will say, if you do want to organize your layers, you can tap on a layer or a group, drag to the next one below until it's highlighted. Boom. Now we have a group. I can double tap, and all my layers are inside that group. If I want to exit, just tap the carrot there and or that little thing that looks like a back indicator and I'll jump you back into your main layer window. Pretty awesome. If you like to be efficient, I like to just work quickly. So <laughs> Kevin says, I like this physics approach. Awesome. Good. I'm glad I didn't make your head explode this morning. Um, but yes, I, I do believe that if you understand the why it makes how to draw that much easier. All right, so looking at, let's, let's draw some simple shapes here. Okay, so I have a shape like this, all right, on the paper, or not the paper, I'm used to drawing on paper too. <laughs> so if I have, if I have a, sh uh, a shape here on my canvas, like so, okay, I just move the shape. If you want to do that, tap the arrow, it'll give you some modifiers, uh, nine points, I believe, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, yes, nine points. And we can scale that, we can move it, place it, flip, all that kind of thing. Um, Tim says, sometimes it behaves like particles. Yes, for purposes of this illustration, I'm going to assume waves. Because we're not looking at the light, right, Tim? Depends on how, if you're looking at it. Is there a cat or is there not a cat in the box? Who knows? Um, Schrodinger's cat reference there. Okay, <laughs> so we have a shape on the paper. There's a couple of things I can use to deduce that this is in perspective. Okay, so one, we have a taper to these lines. Okay. So that's, that's my first indication. Okay. The next thing I can do is if I wanted to, I could place another object in this space like so, for example, and now I have two things in this scene that indicate, okay, there's something happening here in terms of a 3d space. The other way we can do this that I didn't quite list on my chart is light and shadow. All right, so if I want to give this some presence on the page, let's place a light in this scene. So for purposes of this mini lesson, here's a nice little light orb, maybe something like the sun. Okay. And again, I'm going to assume that my light is traveling in straight lines. All right. Maybe something like this. Okay. So I can project a shadow. All right. And if my, it depends on the position of the light. So if I draw an oval here, this is the center of the oval. Okay, my light could be here, could be here, could be here, for example. Depending on where your light is, it's going to cast a shadow in a certain direction. So I'm going to pick this one. Okay, let's go back to my layer. And if my light is here, for example, I may have a shadow that looks something like this. Okay, you might go, oh, how did you do that? Well, basically, you just take the corners. And if you need to rewatch the video, you can watch it after the stream here. But you take these corners, shoot them down like so. And then from this bottom corner, shoot over like so. 
And now we have a shape that we can shade in. And that is our shadow. So if I turn all this off, okay, now we have two, <laughs> now we have two uh, shapes on this page that together communicate some three dimensionality or perspective. Okay. All right. So let's do another example. If I have a volume to this shape, okay, and that's going to be indicated by something like this, and then we're going to jump into painting. So let's let's start with the pencil here, and then we'll we'll jump into painting. You may notice as well, it might be a little hard because the light's so good in this room, but even the faces of of this uh, cube here or shape, right? They have different values. Okay, so value and contrast is also going to help us indicate or form. So I can shade one side like this, okay? And if I use that same shadow trick, all right, I'm gonna end up with something like so. You can calculate it yourself if you want. And if I shade this in, okay? Now we have an even stronger presentation of three-dimensionality, okay? Even stronger. So think about not only the visual presentation, but the information you're putting in there, and that's going to help you draw things in 3D. All right. We do the same thing with something like a cylinder. If I just have these shapes like so, okay, I can make a reasonable assumption that this is a three dimensional shape. But if I just rotate a little bit, add some shadow, we'll talk about why this is the case here in just a second flip my pencil to the side, right? Just a little bit of shade there. And now we have a three dimensional looking cylinder. Pretty cool. You can do the same thing with our circles. Now, that, since we're all nice and warmed up and if I just add a little shadow here, right? Make it a little stronger toward the middle. You'll actually see this technique used quite a bit in figure drawing. Okay. Understanding how to Draw coarse shadows, for example, like so. And now we have a nice sphere. Sphere is such a delightful word to say, sphere. All right, so now we have a nice sphere, cool. So there's, there's a quick hit on light and shadow. Well, what if you're painting? What if you don't wanna just use a pencil to show light and shadow? Well. That's where it gets a little bit trickier, okay? So I'm gonna have to give you one more demo here. So let's go back to our example of a plane. Okay, let's put a plane on top of another shape, like so. Okay, so we've got two shapes now, like so. Again, this is just the default brush, the default pencil in Adobe Fresco here. We can even draw through it to the back just to check our perspective if we want, something like that, okay? So let's say it's resting on this surface. Now, if I were to look at this setup from the side, like so, it might look something like this, okay? There's our ground, as indicated by these hatch marks, and our plane. So I'm gonna draw this label on the other side. So there's our plane. Okay, you can kind of think of a plane like a very stiff, piece of paper, if you will. Okay. Um, I think of it that way. That's just standing there. Now, because light hits uh, or light travels in straight lines, if it hits a shiny enough surface, something magical actually happens. So light hits this surface like so, and it creates an angle. An angle is called the angle of incidence, or just think of it as the angle between a line that goes vertical from where it touches the surface. Now we can reflect that back and to reflect it back, all you have to do is make these two angles equal, right? So I equals R. Why is this important? Well, if I have a scene like this, for example, okay? And I have a light ray hitting the ground, okay? I can imagine that there is some vertical line here and an angle created, dep again, depending on the relative position of the light, okay? where that hits, but let's just say it hits here. That light is going to now reflect back, okay, into my plane. 
So now if I were shading this, I'm going to jump to some custom brushes I actually made. Again, we'll talk about this a little bit tomorrow um, as far as getting your brushes in and, and how to manipulate and mess with those. But I do need to uh, mix some color here. So this is just a marker brush. So it's kind of like an art marker that I like to use. All right, that should work. So if I were shading this in... I might do something like so, for example. All right, and cool. Now, if you take a minute and just look around the room you're in, hopefully it's well lit. If it's not well lit, that's okay. At least you have the light from your monitor, your cell phone, whatever. You'll notice that light is not hitting everything in the room equally. Okay, now, otherwise everything would be washed out. So we have contrast. Even if you look at my face here, you you know, on, on this side, I guess, I've got a light over there that's kind of hitting my, my very shiny face <laughs> this morning. Um, light doesn't hit surfaces evenly, okay? There is a, a fall off to, to, to light sources in rooms. So in addition to that, we have the reflected light that's gonna be coming off the ground. Now, oops, I'm on my eraser. Let's go back to the brush. So because there is some variability in the appearance of the light, I'm actually going to go over the top here a bit again and create almost a gradient. Okay, you can go back and forth, at least with this brush I can. So creating a little bit of a gradient here, going down, and we'll clean up on the sides a little bit. All right, just like that. Now, let's make a new layer. I want to show you something as well. So if I wanted to reflect this shape into the surface, okay, all I need to do is actually go straight down, okay, if, if this were, say, a mirror, okay, so I'm just going to shade down like so, and now on another layer, let's say we want to add a shadow to this, okay, so these are all the building blocks for, again, understanding how to draw and paint things. So if I want to add a shadow, again, depending on the light source, I can shade that in, maybe like so. All right. Always go a little darker too if we want. The shadow likely is going to be your darkest spot in your scene. And then what if I wanted to have this thing on a red floor? What would that look like? Well, what I'm going to do is use the selection tool now Okay, so if you tap on that selection tool, I can draw a selection like so, or I can just tap and it'll calculate the straight points between my taps, similar to the polygonal lasso tool. Okay, similar to the poly polygonal lasso tool. All right. So I've tapped on that corner and I'm just going to make a selection just to make my life a little easier here. And we'll fill this selection with a color. Now you can fill with a paint bucket. You could paint in that shape as well there's many ways to do this it seems like with apps there's lots of ways to do the same thing so find the way that works best for you and do it that way <laughs> not shiny just moisturized indeed exactly all right so let's make the floor red okay or whatever color whatever your favorite color is if you're following along make it whatever color you want okay i'm gonna make this red if you use the paint bucket tool fresco is gonna ask you what do you want to fill this with vectors or pixels for the purposes of our demo today and our session, we're going to focus on pixels, okay? So just hit pixel, cool. Now I'm going to deselect and on my layer options, I can pick different blend modes, for example, so I could pick multiply. Now that I've picked multiply, you can see how the shadow, okay, is now a part of the floor. Pretty cool. So I'm going to accept that, hide my layer properties. If you want to know how to do the layer properties, it's just the second icon down on the right, I guess technically third, that looks like the sliders on a DJ um, deck, right? So if you just slide, if you tap that, it's gonna give you the options for blending modes and opacity of the layer. So if you wanna blend other things behind that, cool. Oops, didn't wanna do that. I'm still on my paint bucket. And if you wanna hide that, just tap the icon again and it slides out. Okay, I should mention it all. I wonder if this is, no, where is it? If you do want to pull out, for example, your brush panel, you can pull that out there um, and we can dock it back. 
if you want to. So there's a lot of flexibility and customization here. If you want to actually hide the interface as well, you can tap those two arrows in the top right corner and it gives you more visibility of your drawing space. Um, it doesn't bother me to have those tools up. So yes. All right. So if this surface is red, okay, I wonder if, I wonder if it'll work on the camera here. I mean, you can kind of see on the bottom of my cube, it's picking up, let's see, it's picking up this other shape. It's a little easier under certain circumstances, but basically what's going to happen is the red is going to affect the surface that we just painted. We're going to, the next step is we're going to do this with some primitive objects, and then we're going to complete a painting today. We're going to do um, some imaginative flower in a pot. Okay. Sorry, I was just checking the chat there. Okay. All right. So we can use a variety of tools here. If I want to use a, uh, an airbrush, I can use that, but let's just use the pencil. Okay. So I'm going to go back to basics or wait, it's under sketching in the Adobe Fresco brushes. Now I did neglect to mention that with Fresco, if there is a brush that you really like, like say, I like the pencil. It's one of my favorite brushes to use in Fresco you can tap this star. So my star was already blue because it was already favorited. But if you haven't done that yet, you can tap the star, boom. And when I tap on favorites, it now has a list of all my favorite brushes that I've been using in Adobe Fresco. So pretty handy if you wanna keep track of maybe uh, some brushes that you're using in a drawing or just over time that you love. Pretty easy to track those. Okay, so back to the pencil here. Now what I'm gonna do, just to make sure we have the right color. If you tap and hold on the screen, a little loop appears and now I can pick any color on the canvas. Okay. So I'm going to pick this red and now just with the pencil on the side, let me make sure I'm on the right layer though. I'm going to create a new layer above this gray and now I can subtly, oh, and this feels just like if you have a matte screen protector on your tablet, it can feel a lot like using the real thing. All right, so I might add some red to this. And this is gonna be important when we start painting, okay? Understanding a bit about how light works and how light impacts other things in a scene. Super, super important. If you want it to feel realistic, if you don't care, then that's fine. But if you want to make things feel more real, you have to understand how light can color and affect other things in a scene, all right? Um, so there's an example of light impacting the scene. Now, if we wanted this to be a bit crisper, one thing of note is that this edge, okay, this edge here would actually be if this surface is shiny enough. Okay. So let's assume that it is shiny enough. Okay. It's going to actually reflect this edge back. So what you can do is just, let's pick a color that we can see here, maybe this blue. So we can take this distance, okay, and go back the same distance into our plane. If you draw a line, that's gonna tell you where your reflection is gonna be, okay? And reflection, if it's shiny enough of a surface, is actually going to be something like that, okay? If that were red. So we'll do that again. Um, let's, we'll not hide. Let's make a new layer. I'm gonna pick this red now and come in like so. Okay. And then now we can kind of shade in here. All right. So I've been drawing for drawing and painting and being creative for over 15 years. And I still, there was a, a comment in the, the chat about the basics. The basics are super important. Um, and it's important you don't forget them and you practice and you understand why things are the way they are because it's going to make uh, drawing realistic things that much easier, okay? And if you want, you can play with the blending mode as well. Kind of like we did with the shadow, I've switched to multiply. If you want it to be less of a reflection, right? If the surface is more, uh, diff or not diffused, but rough, for example, you're going to have less of a reflection, something like that, perhaps, um, and maybe a fuzzy edge. Or if it's a really shiny surface, you're going to get 
a nice color pop. So you get to decide as the illustrator what happens in your scene. Now, if the entire environment's white as well, there's, there's things we can do here, right? To help this feel even better. So on a new layer, okay. I can take some white and on the floor here itself, this plane, we can start to add some shading just to help this feel like it's a part of an environment okay and it's a white environment so that's why we can do this meaning this whole thing is surrounded by just white right and if you need to play with the opacity you can do that as well um, but just a couple examples here guys of how understanding how light work works not work <laughs> How light works can help you create better, more realistic drawings. Okay. All right. <laughs> There's scratches all over the screen. I mean, I do have scratches on my iPad screen. You can't see those though. How do you see those? Okay. So up next, let's paint. Okay. And we'll just do some different materials and looking at some light and then we'll jump into um doing our actual painting our quick painting all right so i'm gonna actually i'm gonna just make a new document all right so now fresco is saving it to the cloud so if i jump onto my desktop i'll actually have this as a psdc file that i can just open up pretty awesome so let's jump to the tabloid here and i'm going to just create a quick pencil sketch all right three objects All right, so maybe something like this, just lightly sketched out, again, in perspective. So one, two, something like that. And let's do a cylinder, just to keep it easy. All right, something like that. And I, I always like to draw the backside of the cylinder just to make sure that, just like the warm-up exercise, you know, I'm kind of hitting the right proportion and so forth. Okay. So I've got three objects here. Now let's say I want to shade and or paint these objects even. All right. So Fresco, like I said, has this thing called live brushes and live brushes are, it, it reminds me of an app I used actually years and years ago, um, but way better because it replicates real world effects when it comes to brushes and expression, things like watercolor and the flow of the paint on your canvas or oils, which we'll use today because I love practicing with oils. So if I tap on live brushes, which is the second icon down from the left or the top on the left. Okay, I have two options right now. I have watercolor and oil. So I'm gonna tap on oil and typically I'll just use the oil paint round. That's the one I, I typically use. Okay, so let's pick, I'm just gonna start with a gray here. So my process when it comes to painting, and we'll use this when we create our scene after this quick example here. Um, my process when it comes to, let's see, do I have that? I don't have that favorited. I'm going to go ahead and favorite. Oh yeah, I do. That's weird. Ah, okay. So <laughs> I guess you just learn something uh, sometimes in the moment, but if you're doing favorites, you'll have favorite live brushes or favorite pixel brushes, but all your favorites aren't in the same menu. Okay, so just remember that because I forgot. All right, so back to my pixel brush here. My process when I'm painting is somewhat like this. So my first thing is gonna be blocking in, oops, let's go with black. All right, so the first step is gonna be blocking in color. All right, the next step is gonna be highs and lows and I'll explain that and then the third is going to be the extra lights okay and then the fourth is going to be details okay so that's how I kind of think about my process when I'm painting all right just break it down make it easy for yourself don't be a clown right don't be a clown break it down okay <laughs> Still need to work on that saying. <laughs> All right. So live brushes, let's jump back to oil paint round and I'm going to pick a mid gray. Okay. So like I said, 
blocking in that color first. My slider keeps jumping like crazy, so apologies there. Um, let's make sure I'm going to make a layer under my sketch. Now, if I do it, if I put the layer above my sketch, then I kind of lose the lines. Here's what I mean. So here's under the sketch. Okay. Here's above the sketch. So if you want to keep track of what you're doing, put your sketch above your colors. It makes it a lot easier for you. So I'm below that sketch. Okay. And now I can kind of paint in this layer. I'm going to make this block something like cement, for example, and I'll show you, um, ways to create those effects if you're just painting, right? So there's one side now that if, if the light is to my right in the scene, then the top and the next surface are going to be lighter. So on the very top, I may have a gray that looks something like this. Now your oils are going to be blending. So if I zoom in here, you'll notice that there's texture to this. Okay. There's texture, texture to this. So just be mindful of that as well as pressure sensitivity is going to determine how much paint gets put on the canvas. I'm just using a randomized stroke for the most part here, right? To help with that texture and we'll worry about blending and so forth in a bit. All right. So there I've got kind of my rough texture. And now on this side, I need to pick something between these two. One way to do that, I can tap on the layer and right here we have the side. So maybe somewhere in the middle. Okay. Just as I roll my finger and now I should have, yep. A gray that is just a touch darker than the top. Right, with room to go a little bit darker or lighter. Now, if you're new to this painting thing and you want to hone in on your contrast, one thing my dad taught me actually, he was a, maybe this will sound familiar. He was a chemist and biologist by um, trade or by training, but at night he would paint. Okay, and that was his thing. He would paint and draw and I, I just, I think of the smell of oil paints and all the, the stuff that uh, he was doing. Anyhow, but he taught me that if you squint your eyes, okay, it can help you focus on the contrast in your scene instead of the detail, okay? <laughs> all right, so now I have these three values set up, okay? We can do the same thing that we did before. So if I have a new layer and let's go with, I don't know, something like a, a blue for the base. Let's turn the sketch back on so we can see here. Um, so let's say my ground color is something of a, a blue for some reason. I don't know why, but let's say it is blue. Let's see here. Okay. Live brush. Now I'm just going to make this bigger and let's just scribble in. Okay. Some color. And we'll use this color, okay, for all of our shapes here. So just quick wash with these oil paints. All right, cool. So now I have a, a bit of reference color. If I want to blend the back and foreground here, I can do that as well. Um, you know, if you just want like a fuzzy background, we can kind of hit the edge of the oil paint. And again, it's going to work like real oil paints would. So if you take more time than I am, for example, you can create a nice blurred edge so that you fade into some, some background, but also the direction in which you paint matters. So if I'm painting from the blue to the white or from the white to the blue. It's going to drag the color in that corresponding direction. So just something to be mindful of, but it is an absolute delight to play with live brushes. So you can get, you can get lost in mixing colors and um playing around pretty easily okay so i have my gray right so i'm going to jump back to my gray here and let's go ahead and pick this gray now i want to mix some blue in so i could make a new layer right or if you look at your color wheel okay in fact i'm just going to go ahead and pick the blue and if i slide this over if you want to try and be careful okay now i have a bluish gray that I can use 
to paint here, right? And you can kind of see it, see it there. So kind of like we talked about, um, if light hits the surface, it's going to reflect up into the shape. All right. So if that doesn't work, cool. But one thing I have done before is you can pick that same color and just kind of mix it with the gray and now pick the new color, say right here. Let's go ahead and reduce my brush size and now kind of integrate that, that blue into the side of whatever you're doing. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and Mix it more here, All right? As I texture this, you can see that blue will be coming in to the side. So again, one of the awesome things about these brushes is just how the the canvas. I mean, you can look at it here. Hopefully, you can see. Um, I'm not sure if you can see all the canvas detail, but it does translate in terms of textures and. Uh, just that warmth you get from real media, which again, super delightful. So if you like mixing colors, play with it and you'll see what I mean. Now, man, time, time always flies. <laughs> so I think we're going to save the scene for tomorrow um, because this stuff's really important. Okay. The color of the light matters as well as you'll, you'll see in this, this quick demo here as well. Okay. So let's hit that and then I'll pick some gray and just kind of mix these on the side. All right, so a little bit of mix in there. Cool. Just like that. Now, let's say our light source is, um, for argument's sake, let's, let's say it's a red light source, okay? Cause I, I like mixing colors and showing, showing you guys how this stuff works. So let's say it's, you know, kind of this, this red light here and let's go ahead and jump to my favorites and pick this soft airbrush. All right. So let's say we have some red, some red light in my scene. I'm just going to put this here just as my red light source. Um, so now on the top of my top of my cement block here, I may have some red. Okay, so I can start to bring that in. Okay, and light's gonna fall off. So you'll kind of have to create a blend from front to back, you know, pick those colors, work back and forth. Right. Play with your uh, pressure on your brush stroke as well. I always also like to work light till I get it right. So sometimes my contrast isn't always um, up to snuff at the beginning of a drawing, but that's okay because you can always um, increase that as needed. Okay. You can always miss or not miss. Sorry. I was looking at the chat. <laughs> Tim said, Oh, you missed the first part of the stream, but you can always, um, increase that contrast. All right. So we have that red light. Um, we're going to get some of that on the ground as well. Let's just go ahead and, and, uh, you know, put that down as reference and I'll do it on top of the blue here. So we get that nice color mix. Okay. And then down the side of the object. Now I think I think there's a little bit of a bug with my my brush window here, but down the side now. Okay, maybe just on this edge. All right, we're gonna get some red and so forth. So think about your scene, think about what's happening, the light, and it'll make it a lot easier. Of course, like I said before, we're going to get shadows. So I'm going to pick this gray and let's go ahead and make it a little bit darker. Okay. And bluer. Increase the size. And now just where the cube's resting, just below where the cube's resting, I'm going to start painting in a little bit of a contact shadow. 
Contact shadow is just a shadow that's formed when you have an object sitting on top of a surface. I really should merge these layers because I do want the colors to interplay, but I'm going to hold off merging for now. All right, so a little bit of contact shadow there. And now let's increase my brush size. I'm going to pick this blue so I can modify this blue. And let's desaturate and make it darker. So if you want to do the sliders, you can tap on HSB sliders, and that'll give you the option and flexibility to adjust your hue, saturation, and brightness. Okay. So zooming in here, right, I'm going to drop the brightness down. And you can do some tests. Okay, we can do some tests and see, okay, is that dark enough? Is it too saturated? Nothing wrong with that. I'm going to lower the saturation and the brightness as well. All right. So, oops. Yeah, it seems as though when I tap on that right now, at least, because I'm I'm using a funky build of the app, my apologies, um, it's causing me a little bit of grief. But let's go ahead and start painting in our shadow. All right, I know the shadow, if it were crisp, would look something like so. All right, so I can kind of just rough in that, that shape. And again, if we need to get darker, we can. Now... Comparing the shadow to the side of this cube, I kind of want some of the shadow gray here in the side of the cube. So I'm going to try and darken this up a bit, maybe bring back some of this blue, okay, as well. So when, you, when you're lighting something, when you're thinking about it, remember, there's going to be an interplay, okay? So for tomorrow's... Uh, stream we're gonna do a scene and it's gonna be more complex than this so that's kind of why I wanted to go over the basics so that if you are following along you can start to think about how you might do your blends um, and think about colors and so forth okay so that trick where you can you know tap on the layer Okay, hold with the finger and see the loop. Super useful if you're trying to pick colors. All right, and now I can kind of blend back and forth. Remember, squint your eyes if you need to because it's going to help you see if you have enough contrast. I mean, you could even squint your eyes at my painting. And then as far as blends go, okay, I've got a nice mid value here. So I'm just going to paint back and forth like so. And now we don't have a straight gray side here now we have some interesting interplay of color right i do need to work on some of these blends a little bit so let's go ahead and do that now this is all with the round oil i i just tend to like it it's simple i don't have to think too much about it right and i can kind of work back and forth and get what i need so if there is um another oil that you like right you can you can use that too all right i'm just going to reflect a bit of the shadow into the side of the cube okay just like that some brush strokes there and if i need to lighten that up make it a little fuzzy just pick the adjacent color and we'll kind of kind of fuzzify that if you will all right so there's the beginnings of lighting lighting this this cube this cement cube for example maybe it's a little bit rougher you can do the same thing on this side all right just let's throw some some blue on the side there and now just kind of pick colors and see if we can create the effect so look at what the oils are doing they're just blending right and now i have a nice blue and if i want to you know lighten that up we can continue to mix colors pick that color again so now that we have a rich light uh effect here on the side of the cube it's no longer just gray okay i wanted to start with gray to show you how the colors in the scene might affect each other okay and here it is without the sketch okay now we've covered blocking in the color doing some highs and lows some extra lights and so the last step would be um Making making it a little crisper. Okay, working on the details. So I might use smaller brushes. Okay, for example, let's go ahead and reduce the size of my brush. Maybe down to, in this case, about 22, 24. I'm going to make this 
little brighter. Okay, or I'm just gonna use the color picker. My app is, is acting a little weird this morning. All right, so now I might come in and add highlights or if I need to intensify some red spots. Okay, for some reason, we can do that. By some reason, I mean, you're in control as the illustrator, so you get to decide how you want this to be. All right, if, for example, one of these sides has a face or part of the surface rather is facing the light. So let's say there's a little bit of a return change in direction to the surface. I could paint something in like so. Okay, and then maybe come in here. Let's lower saturation darkness and we'll do lightest lights against darkest darks. And that's a way to get there to be some more contrast in your painting. Okay. And we can keep blending those. So that's where I would spend some time is, you know, when I zoom out, okay, you can see it looks a lot tighter um, and more together. And depending on your style, right, you can get creative, play with your brush stroke, your stroke direction to get what you want. Um, let's say I did want to, in this case, add some cracks because this is actually a cement block. So cracks, texture, things like that. Um, I'm going to jump back to my brushes my live brushes and let's go to my oil um there's a detail oil brush that we can use here All right so let's make this even smaller and now what i might do okay on top of everything let's now start to paint in some cracks okay maybe something like this Whatever makes sense for the object that you are painting, okay? In my case, I just wanted to, to do some cement this morning. Some sort of... I don't know if you guys uh, actually live in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, and I don't know if you saw the news report recently of the obelisk that showed up and people were freaking out. Um, maybe this is our obelisk this morning. A cube, cubalisk. Is that even a word? I don't think that's a word. But it's okay. This is Adobe Live where we get creative. Okay, so we can make up our own words, even. I hope that's okay, Tim. <laughs> Anyhow, um, yeah, that was in the news and then it just disappeared. So maybe you caught that, maybe not. All right, so I'll, I'll do the cracks and then I'll kind of explain a little bit of, of what's going on in the thought in doing that that crack so yeah like i was saying for some reason when i when i tap and slide here it just goes to the maximum size and i think i just need to reboot my ipad because it's never done that before these things are a little tricky all right a little bit of surface change there Perhaps let's go ahead and neutralize some of the blue a bit. I'm just painting with a very light gray over the blue like so just a nice, just a nice light scratch. Okay. Also, if you take time to look around the room you're in, you'll notice again that these surfaces that are or whenever the wall changes direction or even if you pick up an object that's near to you, whenever that surface changes direction, it has a change in the lighting. Okay, it has a, a definitive difference in contrast. And so that's what I'm trying to do here on the edges is just accentuate some of that contrast. Okay, just enough. Remember, squint your eyes, look at it. If it looks 3D, cool. <laughs> Well, Tim says, welcome to Adobe Live where everything's made up and points don't matter. 
Oh man, good times. It's always a good time on Adobe Live. All right. Is this? Oh, okay. I thought that was the detail brush blown up really, uh, really large there for a sec. Okay. So I'm going to kind of hit the side with some red too. All right. I want some of that red to show through because again, the light is red. All right. And let's also paint in a reflection on our surface. So I'm going to pick one of these light blue gray colors here. Let's see. Let's kind of blend this in. Now I like painting on the same surface or the same layer, mostly because of the opportunity for me to practice. You could do this on multiple layers if you want to make it easier for yourself, for example. Um, but I do like the idea of mixing my colors and uh, the benefit you get of the live brushes kind of working together. All right, so let's get our little reflection in. Now, if it's really a reflection, we're going to get reflection of the value as well here. So depending on how shiny the surface is, of course, so I'm going to try and capture some of these, these lights by lights. I mean the value, and then we can kind of trail off. Okay. And let's go ahead and fix our shadow. I'm going to make this a little bit darker. through here and back to my layer above I do want to soften a bit of what's happening because it's in shadow you're not going to get as much detail happening so I do want to see if I can yeah there we go so I do want to make this corner just a little bit darker All right, so these are these are just basic principles and ideas. Basic principle, principles and ideas that you can use to um, paint things. You know, I've done product design, game design, furniture, uh, illustration, architecture. And as long as you understand the principles, you can become very flexible in your visual communication skills ability and so forth all right so i did have that red spot on the ground let's go ahead and just blend that okay oops sorry guys <laughs> opened up my discord there okay so i did have this red spot on the ground so let's go ahead and take that now and see if we can kind of just blend this Okay, blend this in so we have that, that light. And then we'll turn on the other layers and finish up. Now, also by way of information, there are some settings you can play with depending on how you want your brushes to behave. So if you tap on the layer, I am using the pre-release, Tim. <laughs> um, I was told I could. If you tap on the layer, okay, or not the layer, but the brush itself, um, you'll notice that on the lower left side, we do have some options. So things like paint mix how much does the paint mix okay so if you crank this all the way down paint's not going to mix as much in terms of color okay and if we crank this up we're going to have more of a 
a mixing of those colors. So if you want more mix, you can have that, right? If you want more opaque or just rather um, definitive color on the canvas, you can do that as well. But we're just gonna kind of blend through here a little bit. And for example, I might wanna drop my mix down so that when I want to put my nice intense spot of color, I can do that, All right? Actually, it would probably be somewhere here, now that I think about it. If my light is indeed in that position. So you can do something like that, right? And then I'll just take this blue now. I'm going to drop the mix down. And we'll just cover up. Okay. So play with your settings. Maybe not cover up entirely, but um, play with your settings and you can figure out what's best for you. All right, so let's turn these back on now and we have our other objects here. So how about we do um, something shiny? So we can do the cylinder, is real shiny. And when it comes to shiny cylinders, my advice would be, this is gonna sound weird. Next time you go to a public restroom, just pay attention to the pipes you see. <laughs> um, and that's all I'll say. So you can, you can take a look you know, draw from observation so you can draw from imagination. But again, I'll start with this gray. Not that every shape is gray, but I'll start with gray in this case. It's on a new layer on its own. We have low paint mix settings. So I'm going to get some nice crisp lines. These, yeah, nice and low. So I'll start with some gray. And then now I want to think about reflection. So if this gray, well, Actually, my light would not be there, but um, if this gray, so we'll, we'll fix the ground. If this gray uh, cylinder, or sorry, uh, concrete is receiving red light, I may get some red being reflected back into the cylinder, for example. But that being said, first thing I'm gonna do here is again, think about the environment. So what what's in the environment, what's reflecting? Um, we can make some assumptions. Um, and use some common conventions to show the reflectivity. All right, so in this case, maybe I have a nice sharp black spot here. Okay, something like that. And on this side, like I mentioned, I'm gonna pick some of this red. Let's reduce the brush size and I'll have some, some nice red reflecting in. Okay, maybe something like that. And we also have the environment Okay, that may be reflecting in, which is going to be white. I'm just gonna pick white for purposes of this example. So we have, say, a nice white spot here, something like that. And then the top of the cylinder, I'm going to make white as well. Okay, maybe with a nice hit of red on top. Let's lower the size. Get some of these edges with our light. So remember, you can play with that paint mix if you are trying to lay down more definitive, crisp, opaque color. Or if you want more of a blend, you can increase that paint mix. Okay, so maybe we have something like that. Turn the sketch off. Take a look at what you have. Okay, I need a little bit of work here. So right where we, for example, change direction and surface. I'm gonna up a little bit, let's up our paint mix. And now just on this, oops, wrong layer. It's screaming at me, just on this edge. Just on this edge now, I can increase my contrast. All right, so the black stuff you see on something that is super shiny, like I said, if you want to get good at this stuff, start drawing from your uh, observation, is you'll notice that things in the environment, right, may get compressed, start reflecting into something that is very shiny. So kind of think of it that way. This might be a person. This could be Tim standing. Right, maybe this, that's Tim's arm or something. Okay, so this could be this could be someone standing there, right? Looking at our scene. 
It's one way to think about it. And then you're also gonna have very bright spots here and there if it's really, really shiny. So depending on, on how shiny it is, okay, you can play with placing your contrast in places that help reinforce what's happening. Now, since this is digital, we can actually erase. So if you do make a mistake or if you went too far in the bottom and you just wanna save some time, you can actually just erase a little bit, which is what I'm doing. And because it's on a separate layer, it's a lot easier to do that. Okay, so if we did want to make this a little crisper. Now, when you erase, it's going to, uh, I think, make it a bit more obvious what's happening. Um, so what I like to do, if I do that, is now come back in with, say, the color on the perimeter. Okay, we can kind of rough, rough this up. So it feels like... Yeah, you got that right. There's no erasing here. This is our little secret. Don't tell anyone, though. All right. I was just thinking to myself, I always overestimate what I can do in an hour and a half. And I, I think that's perhaps one of the dilemmas of creative people is we want to do so much, and sometimes... Sometimes we don't quite get there, but it's okay. I'm glad we were able to cover some basics today. Like I said, tomorrow we're going to jump in and do more uh, scene-based stuff. But if you do practice, remember you can share your work on the uh, Photoshop Discord. That is bit.ly slash psdiscord. If you do, just look me up and tag me so I can see your post and be aware of it. Okay, so let's say I have a nice little cylinder there okay a little cylinder um and again i know it's super basic stuff today but hopefully you guys have uh been reminded of some important things or perhaps and i i'm in anticipation of what i'm going to paint in front i'm going to just actually change my color here but hopefully you've learned some good stuff or been reminded of things that you already knew it's all good all right so nice bigger brush here and I'm going to go ahead and add some warmth okay, to this part. So this is an anticipation of the sphere I want to do here. Um, and it's, it's just a guess of where the sphere would be. There are ways to calculate this. Um, in fact, looking at this, I might actually reposition just with a few paint strokes, kind of raise this up a little bit or make it not as um, crisp or crisp of a reflection but now I can take this color and I'm gonna go with more saturated because again if something's closer to us we want it to have more saturation lower my paint mix okay so let's say we have this nice ball here okay we can even turn the sketch off I don't need the sketch anymore so now I'm gonna take Actually, this, this red light here is confusing me, so I'm going to turn that off. <laughs> but I'm going to take the red here and now adjust my mix up and start to paint in a highlight. Okay, maybe something like this. Nice intense red on this ball. And then for the shadow here, you could even take some of this blue on the... Uh, on that cube and use that. And then we'll just kind of blend these, okay, as we go. So I'll take this mid color. Actually, while I do that, I do need to pull up, apologies, I do need to pull up the schedule for today to share with you. So give me just a sec. Let's see here, boom. Just a second. This will be worth it, I promise. Because we got an exciting day coming up, as always. As always. Uh, let's see. 
Okay, cool. <laughs> so we'll go over that in just a sec. All right, let's finish up real quick, and then I'll give you a preview of tomorrow. All right, so we have this, and hopefully you can kind of see the pattern here. I mean, we're not going to be able to, to finish this up um, for sure today, but just blending back and forth. Remember the direction in which you paint is going to affect how the paint blends. So if I want to blend into the blue, right, I'm painting toward the blue here from the orange. Okay, and maintaining that core, and you get that nice, that nice paint mix, right? So and then if I want to intensify that, Right, we can lower the brush size. Okay, and now I can create a nice core. Right, or again, if I don't want that mix and I just want to paint right on, we can do that. So take some time, just play with it. All right, and you'll be able to get super creative. All right, so tomorrow we're going to create a scene. I'll either do a potted plant or um, an outdoor scene. I guess if you have any preferences, let me know. Um, I'll be happy to uh, take a look at that and make sure that we get started the right way tomorrow, of course. All right, just hinting at a little bit of reflection there. So I'm probably gonna work on this a little bit after the stream, but coming up today, we have, let's see here. We have the Photoshop Daily Creative Challenge with Paul Tranny later. We have, or that's at 9 a.m. right after this. We have character design with Jonah Loeb. That actually looks really interesting. Not that, you know, Paul's isn't interesting. They're all good. But I'm going to tune in for that one. Illustrator Daily Creative Challenge with Julia Masalska. We have video editing at 12 p.m. Pacific with Olivia and Zach Fields. At 2 p.m. we have the XD Creative Challenge with Howard Pinsky. Always good, too. And Doodle Therapy at 2.30 p.m. with Alice Lee and Sid Weiler. Or Weiler. I'm not really not really sure how to pronounce names. I'm known for butchering names. So that's it for today, guys. I hope you've uh, been able to follow along and learn some stuff. We'll be back tomorrow. And I hope you're back here with me to get started in Adobe Fresco. If you missed the stream, that's okay. We'll be here. We'll be here waiting with a replay for you to check out. All right, take care and I will see you guys tomorrow morning. Peace and love on Adobe Live.